Welcome to Take the Lead Radio with Dr. Diane Hamilton, where she interviews some of the most successful leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and other individuals who will inspire you to take the lead in your career and personal life. And now, here is Dr. Diane Hamilton. Welcome to Take the Lead Radio. This is Dr. Diane Hamilton. I'm here with Mark Rudolph. He is a branding advisor to CEOs, and he has a new book, Brand is Destiny. And I'm very anxious to hear about your new book. Welcome. Great to be here, Diane. Well, I I know we haven't had a chance to really chat much, and I'd love to hear about what you do, and you have more than one book. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do with CEOs? Yes. The CEO is the brander-in-chief. And what I've discovered in my endeavors is that most CEOs don't know that much about branding and unfortunately are quite dismissive of it. In fact, a lot of them think it's something that comes out of the PR department. And that's a mistake. In fact, uh, a brand has nothing at all to do with your product or your service. The brand is a value proposition that the, it, your company delivers to the customers. And from that value, and, and the value proposition is something that comes from the customers and must be articulated in customer language. So if you imagine an org chart, the brand is at the top, and reporting to the brand are products, people, and processes. Hmm. So the brand sets the purpose and direction of your company. So if you don't have a purpose and a direction, where are you going? What are you doing? That's why the CEO's number one responsibility and priority must be branding. So let me give you an example. Uh, And I use it in my new book, Brand is Destiny, the Ultimate Bottom Line. And, And the reason for that subtitle is that if you have a weak brand, you're going to have a weak bottom line. Now, my first book is called Be Unique or Be Ignored, The CEO's Guide to Branding. Why did I write that? If you look at most companies in every industry sector, they look and sound alike. And no more, uh, no, no place is there a better example of that than Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. They all, they all use the same jargon and they all chase the same technologies. Now, if you're not unique, you don't have a brand. If you're, if you're looking like every other company and sounding like every other company, you're generic. And there's no reason for any customer to purchase from you. In fact, there will be an exercise of eeny, meeny, miny, mo. That's the last <laughs> thing you want. Right. And that makes you a commodity, mm-hmm. and therefore you'll have to price like a commodity. So that's why I wrote the first book. Mm-hmm. And... You should know this from your background. Mm -hmm. Most people hate the thought of being unique. They hate the thought of standing out alone. (laughs) It's scary for them. They like, people like to blend. Mm -hmm. They don't like to brand. And that's why most people and most companies do blend. So I wrote the second book, Grand as Destiny, because I, I needed to drive the point home even harder that your brand really determines where you go. And if you don't have one, and most companies don't, you're going to drift and crash. Just think of the Titanic. And that's what happens a lot. And the, uh, the, the, the main case study I have in my book is about Sears. Sears invented retail. Right. Sears was the number one retailer in the world, and now it is six inches away from the coffin. Yeah, it really because is. Sears did Sears did everything wrong, and Sears was became nothing more than a glorified warehouse. And uh, right now, the whole retail sector is in trouble. Uh, and we see, you know, uh, Macy's just reported the other day that it's in trouble and. We see them falling by the wayside. And they all say, well, we have to blame Amazon. We have to blame the Internet. (laughs) Well, that's that's the, in fact, you know, the CEO of Sears, Ed Lampert, Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. He blamed the unfair media, the irresponsible media, for Mm -hmm. the demise of Sears. That's idiotic. There's no uh, blame on lack of proactive thinking, right? (laughs) So the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, a brand is an emotional connection that customers have with a vendor. So in my book, I give I, my prototypical example of branding is the upscale beauty spa. And the brand of our beauty spa is we make you feel young, beautiful, and confident. That's a brand. Mm-hmm. Now, did you hear a product there? Did you hear a service there? Did you hear a technology? No. 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 And you heard do, a value proposition. How, how does that, how do people differentiate brand from mission or vision? Do you have a way of, that you describe that to them? Yes, I'm glad you asked that question. I don't mm-hmm. like mission states. They're mm-hmm. meaningless. Mm-hmm. And mission and state, if you read mission and statement, they're always internal. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to be the number one manufacturer on the East Coast. Well, right. customers don't care about that. Right, right. <laughs> and so why why do you have that mission when it has nothing to do with customers? Right. So a mission statement is counterproductive, actually, because you're focused on yourself. Mm-hmm. And a brand puts the focus on the customer. And in Silicon Valley, for example, people hate the thought of focusing on the customer because they, they're in love with themselves. They're in love with their technology. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I just posted a new article the other day on artificial intelligence. And what I define as artificial intelligence is making decisions without critical thinking. Huh. That's artificial That's intelligence. And, and I spoke to a, a CEO the other day who said, I'm going to put artificial intelligence in all of our products. And I asked him why. And he gave me a blank stare. And then said, because everybody else is doing it. Now, that's so typical. <laughs> right. What does that have to do with customers? Uh-huh. Nothing. Nothing. Well, ha- and so, so you're talking to CEOs, right? Why, uh, why not? Well, the, the re- again, again the, the reason is because if the CEO doesn't like something, it ain't going to happen. Right, right. And you can toil away in the marketing department mm-hmm. to create something bold, which is what branding has to be. Uh, but if the CEO is against it, and often this happens because the CEO says, well, I wouldn't say that because it makes the CEO uncomfortable mm-hmm. because CEOs are actually very conservative and timid. Mm-hmm. They don't like to stand out. They like to go to conferences and say the same thing as the 50 other panelists. They, they feel comfortable. It's part of a club. But that's not what branding's all about. And these days, with the political correctness, where every word in the English language is now offensive, a trigger word, a microaggression, they're even more timid than ever. So there are very few people who actually have the guts to brand, to stand out, to be bold, to tweak the audience, to peak the audience. Okay. And that's what you have to do. I, you know what's interesting? Because I attended the CMO, uh, Forbes CMO event last fall. And the biggest issue I keep hearing is trying to get their message out at scale. How do you address that? Try, I'm sorry. Try to get the message out at scale. The bigger the company, the, you know, trying to get with all the technologies and to 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 reach everybody in a personalized way. Well, I, I hope. Are you talking about social media? The, social media, yeah, all the different technologies. Well, social media doesn't work. Uh huh. Why? Why do you uh, think you that? Know, because all of the uh, all of the uh, analysis of it proves that, and I have it in my book. People on social media, first of all, let's take the word social. Uh-huh. It doesn't gel with business. And, what, and if, okay. did you know that 60, 60% of Twitter users never read the tweets that they retweet <laughs> or like? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. so you have, what, what you're doing is, is, imagine sitting in a car. Right. And playing all of the radio stations simultaneously. 
Yeah, it does. That, it's a lot of that's the, that's the Twitter verse. Mm -hmm. You can't reach people who don't want to be reached. If I go to your party at your house and I start pushing my product, people are going to ask me to leave because social and business don't mix. So how, and, how do you also, get around it then? If you if it doesn't work, what do you use instead? Guess what works really well? Email. Email works much better. And also, uh, the thing is, is that branding has two components, the message and the megaphone. Okay. Most people think that branding is the megaphone, and that's what they focus on. So they become the next Geico commercial. They keep repeating and repeating and repeating a message that makes absolutely no sense until you get so worn down that you might buy the product. Now, a lot of people say to me when I mention Geico, oh, I really love those Geico commercials. They're so funny. And I say, <laughs> are you a Geico customer? No. Yeah, you sound like what I say so, to my marketing students. That I say some similar things because some of them are great commercials. They're fun to watch, but it doesn't make you want to buy it. I understand what you're saying. Commercials, and, and I have a book, uh, excuse me, a chapter in my book called Skip the Super Bowl. Super Bowl advertising is a total waste of money. You have all of these commercials vying for funniest commercial, best commercial, favorite commercial, and they don't sell any products. The commercial is never supposed to be entertainment. It can be entertaining, but never entertainment. Once it's entertainment, it ceases to do its job. What is its job? Sell the product. I'm curious where you, you get your um, data to, to support your points on this. Do you have a lot of research behind this? Well, I, some of the research is, is mine, but a lot of the research is done widely. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the research on Super Bowl advertising is well known. Mm -hmm. It's not Apparently, it's not known to the people who fork over millions of dollars to advertise. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, do, do you remember the famous Mean Joe Green commercial with Coca-Cola right. back in the uh -huh. 80s? Oh, the football it won awards. Yeah. Yeah, it I made remember. people cry. They loved it. And Coca-Cola yanked the commercial because it didn't sell one carton of Coke, even though everybody loved it, because that's not its job. Its job is to sell the product. Now, again, we've, we have to go back to branding message and megaphone. And the message is more important than the megaphone, because if you have a great message, the megaphone part is easy. Almost everybody can do the megaphone part. Very few people can do the message part, and that's the most important part. Right. How right. many people have you seen get up on a microphone and have nothing to say? Or whatever whatever he has to say is done so poorly that mm -hmm. people are going to sleep. Right. So you can have a great megaphone and blow it because you have no message. And that's what people don't understand. They just think if we put it on Twitter... If we put it on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever, and have a lot of TV commercials, radio commercials, that's it. We've covered it. Right. We got it out there. Well, but it's not about awareness. It's about connection. How how do you so feel that's about, what's key? Well, how do you feel about you know if you like email, the, the texting now? I mean, that's still getting right to them without going through social media. Now that they, you know, text XYZ code to this number and now you're on this, like, list. And how do you feel about that for getting the message? I, 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 find, I find it to be very intrusive. Are you talking about bombarding me with ads over my text, well, text message? Well, if they were bombarding. But I'm saying the way you would do email, you know, just a occasional. No, I don't. I personally don't like it, and when I get it, I always block the number. Mm -hmm. So you're, uh, I you, you think that email is the, just the way to go, that none of the other areas are well, as effective? Well, e email, email is very effective mm -hmm. if, if it's done properly, mm -hmm. and of course, if you, you, you can also put off people and they'll opt out too, mm -hmm. but it is, it's been documented that it's much more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, I can I point in my book to a study that Harvard Business Review did about uh, Twitter, and they said, does it help the bottom line? And the answer was, hashtag nope. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. so the thing is, is that uh, uh, trade shows also work. Uh -huh. 
they work very well. And one of the reasons they work very well is because you can get face to face with people. Right. So I have a chapter in my book called Social Mediapathy. Mm-hmm. I created a new term, social mediapathy. <laughs> Uh-huh. The That's social good. media uh-huh. has made people so apathetic that, that they think nothing of torturing each other online, being rude to each other, and they yeah. carry this rudeness yeah. and boorish behavior mm-hmm. into face-to-face confrontations. People don't even know how to converse anymore. Uh, yeah. They don't even know what, what basic manners are anymore. And not returning phone calls and emails anymore is now say rigueur. I mean, they don't—they don't think anything of being rude, and that's all come from social media. The the the, the disconnect and the distance from people. Where do you lump uh, YouTube videos? I mean, do you, that's a commercial uh, in a way, but it, you're not paying for it. And, and how do you do? You think that that's worth time? Well, I have a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. If you go to markrudov.tv, dot mm-hmm. TV, uh, which is part of markrudov.com, dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, the, the book that you mentioned, Brand is Destiny, that's at brandisdestiny.com. But I have 50-plus uh, uh, YouTube videos on branding right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people watch them. Some people don't. Uh, get, anything that works where you can get capture somebody's attention and, and educate them and motivate them to do something that's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. But the the thing is that what works the best, and a lot of millennials won't like to hear that, is that the fundamentals never die. Mm-hmm. So face-to-face meetings where you're not texting, you're actually talking to real human beings, <laughs> that works the best. Mm-hmm. And that's why trade shows work, because you can you can actually see people. But the way you design your booth and the messaging of your booth, of course, is very important also. If it's all about technology and not about the customer need, then you're going to have a harder time. And so anything that can get you actually engaged with real people is is always going to work the best. Those fundamentals are never die well, because going, human beings make purchase decisions well going back to, to getting the brand right i mean now you're talking get you, we've talked enough of, i think about the megaphone and i want to know how can they get the brand right well first of all uh, you have to know your audience okay and when i said when i gave you the example before of the upper the upscale beauty spa and i said we keep you feeling young beautiful and confident mm-hmm. well why why did we say that because we know our customers and we know that's what they want because that's what they say to us. So you, the brand is the customer's words being reflected back to the customers. It's not your words. You need to get out of your ivory tower. And this is why I say in my book that Apple's new spaceship headquarters will kill its brand. Why? Why? Because the people will love it so much in there They'll never leave. They'll be so in love with themselves because they'll feel so elitist for being in such a place that they will lose connection with the customers. And when you do that, you're in trouble. And all of the messaging will be about you and your technology and your products and your wonderful, wonderful employees. And that's what I when I call that the the window of opportunity becomes the mirror of hubris. When you start to see your own reflection, right. you can't brand at all. So I'm glad you asked that question. The brand is always a message that comes from the customers that you're astute enough to detect and articulate in a clever way so they will react to it, remember it, and repeat it. What if they have a mixed they, message? What if you have more than one message coming from your customers? Then you're the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and in fact, that, that's, why, that's why IBM uh, IBM sales have shrunk 20 quarters in a row because it has no brand. Uh-huh. Every message that comes out of IBM is a product message. And that's what you should not do. So if you have your that, message, but how do you fix it? 
well, number one, stop doing it. <laughs> the, the, C, the CEO has to become a yeah. dictator. Uh-huh. And the, the dictator says, we will not use jargon anymore. So we're not going to stop. We're going to stop dropping buzzwords. And we're going to stop being in love with our products. And we're going to stop chasing technology. Technology is a means to an end. It's not the end. But you would not know that if you're in the Silicon Valleys, the Silicon Prairies, the Silicon whatever, because they are technocentric. They have what I call technologica erotica. Mm -hmm. They're literally sexually aroused by technology. That's the last thing you should do. You should be chasing problems, not technologies. So if you're in love with the technology, for example, you see uh, ads for marketing people, uh, job ads for marketing people, and they say, you must love wireless technology. Mm -hmm. Why? Once you love the technology, mm -hmm. then your solution is preordained, and you're going to force something on customers rather than saying, you should have this attitude. If I can solve your problem with paper clips and chewing gum, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And not say, it has to be an app. It has to be wireless. We have to have artificial intelligence. We have to use the cloud. We have to say SaaS. Everything's SaaS. Service, uh, software as a service, platform as a service, mobility as a service. And when they talk about internet TV, what do they say? It's OTT, over the top. Mm -hmm. What about around the side? How about under the bottom? <laughs> what's missing? What's missing from all this jargon? Customer. What? How about internet of things? What the hell is that? <laughs> Okay, so what if they do, what if your customers hate email and you you can't get them to an event? What what do you, what well, other options do you have? Well, if the customers hate email and you can't get them to an event, mm -hmm. uh, then they're likely not to be your customers. Okay. Uh, if if um, well, you have to give me an example of a customer who. Hates email. Well, I but think still... younger generations are, are not as uh, into email. They they prefer to get their information other ways. So are are you? Yes, but they're also and guess what? They're also not loyal at all. Right. They're not loyal to each other, and they're not loyal to any vendors. But eventually, they will grow up. We hope. The fact of the matter is. Unless you can make a connection with another human being, you're not going to get very far. And a lot of people think that branding is about, you have to hear the, the term brand awareness. Mm -hmm. Awareness means nothing. It's connection. People are aware that they should exercise and eat healthy food. Right. Very few people do. So awareness is not the key. Connection is the key. People have to react to it, remember it, and repeat it. If you can communicate with another human being in his language and articulate his needs, he will be interested. So what, what if you just Well, I'm just curious what email stuck out what what type of an email do you think is the most impactful then? Well, it, it, an email that addresses it, it does what I just said. If, uh, if I send you an email mm -hmm. that I know describes your biggest pain or your biggest wish, then I'm going to, to and, and it sounds, it, and if you read it mm -hmm. and you say, he's talking to me, mm -hmm. he's actually talking to me, then you're going to be motivated to pursue something. Well, you know, if it just sounds like vendor hype. Right. That it's not going to work. But it, how do you, yeah. you know? All your customers have different pains. I mean, how are you determining their pain? And if it's at well, scale, you, you, how do you do that when you have to reach well, a that, large audience? That, that's what segmentation is all about. Mm -hmm. The uh, the newer your product, first of all, let's go back to the basics. We don't brand our product. We product our brand, which means 
we already have a connection with an audience. The audience might be a million people. It might be 500,000 people. It might be 100 million people. It all depends on what we're offering. If, if I'm selling um, a staple, such as food, then the audience will be infinite. But if I'm selling something very specific uh, for, you know, a product for men, a product for women, a mm -hmm. product for young women, then the audience gets smaller and smaller. You have to speak to an audience, and you have to know what that audience is. You have to have it very well defined. And you have to know when you, when you define an audience, you have to know the audience's characteristics. One of the chapters in my book is, da da da, -da know your audience. <laughs> well, you know. Another, so then you have to know what, how these people feel and what is bothering them, you know, what is their pain. Right, and, right. Or what is their wish? And you have to get you have to talk to them face to face, not over Twitter, where people are likeaholics and they <laughs> like things. Here, let me tell you something about this. I'm a real student of this. Uh -huh. I create videos that are anywhere from three to ten minutes uh -huh. long. Right. I post a video on Twitter, and within Thirty seconds, people like it already. Right, right. I, I know it. They saying. haven't even watched. It. Right, right. There, there is. So if, if you depend on the likeaholics, right, you're gonna you're gonna sink your company. Wow. So that means that you have to get out there and mix with your audience and interview your audience face to face and understand what do they really want, and you're only gonna do that in person. You know, Mark. Now, if it, you're afraid uh, to do that. Well, I think that, uh, no, I just think, you know, that's a great, actually probably a good stopping point because I think you made a perfect point and I, I know we're running out of time and I want to make sure you get in some um, information to, uh, one more time. I know you mentioned quickly some of your websites, but I want to make sure you share it again because I'm sure a lot of people will find this really fascinating. Can you share with everybody how to reach you and to find out more about your book? Yes. I'm happy to do that, okay. as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, first of all, if you go to if you go to if you if you want to read my new book, the link I'm about to give you will take you to my website. So that's fine. It's called brandisdestiny.com. The book is Brand is Destiny: The Ultimate Bottom Line, and the reason for that is the brand is your value proposition. It sets the purpose and direction of your company. If your company has no purpose and direction, what kind of a bottom line do you think it's going to have? Right. Where are you headed? If, you're, if your company has no purpose or direction, you're going to drift and crash. Think Titanic. Well, so if you go to brandisdestiny.com, you can get my book, and then you'll be on my website, and you can see my branding services and other things that I've done. But well, thank you. this was really key. That was that was really great information, Mark, and I hope everybody takes some time to uh, research his site. I, I hate to cut you off here, but we're running out of time, and I, I, I know we have... Um, you got so much great information. Maybe we'll have you come back another time, and we'll talk some more. But thank you for being on the show today. It's been my pleasure, Diane, and I, uh, I hope to hear from your audience. I'm sure you will. And I, um, I look forward to uh, seeing how well your book does. And we will be back right after this message. <laughs> 